Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well. We're continuing our reading of Frederick Nietzsche's The Spoke Zarathustra book. We are now in the section that's titled The Tomb Song. So I wonder if it's going to be about death or a bit dark, which should be juicy. So let's begin. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The Tomb Song. There is the Isle of Tombs, the Silent Isle. There too are the tombs of my youth. There I wish to carry an evergreen wreath of life. Resolving this in my heart, I cross the sea. O oh, you visions and apparitions of my youth, O oh, all you glances of love, you divine moments, how quickly you died. Today I recall you like dead friends. So here, I recall you like dead friends. Tombs of my youth. The silent isle. Visions and apparitions of my youth. We do tend to live in the past sometimes. To have this sort of nostalgia things going on when we look at how simple life was. Yet when we were young, all we wanted to do was to get older. So, I mean, the paradox of that. But we can romanticize the past a bit too much. So let's see if he does the same here. From you, my dearest friends among the dead, a sweet scent comes to me, loosening heart and tears. Verily, it perturbs and loosens the heart of the lonely seafarer. I am still the richest and most enviable, I the loneliest, for once I possessed you, and you still possess me. So here, he lost the possession, but they still maintain it. People envy him, he's wealthy, yet he's lonely. Say to whom fell, as to me, such rose apples from the bow. I am still the heir of your love and its soil, flowering in remembrance of you with motley wild virtues. O oh, you most loved ones. Alas, we were fashioned to remain close to each other. You fair and strained wonders, and you came to me and my craving not like shy birds, but like trusting ones to him who trusts. So. A shy bird is skittish. It comes like deep, 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 deep. Whereas the ones who aren't shy, they're just coming straight to you. A good example would be the seagull. It's very eager. You know, they come right away. A shyer bird. In the beginning, it's chickens, right? A parrot can be a mixture. So, when you see him use that example, you see in different personalities come about. Indeed fashioned for loyalty, like myself, and for tender eternities. I must now call you after your disloyalty, you divine glances and moments. I have not yet learned any other name. Verily, you have died too soon for me, you fugitives. So, a fugitive, some, some person that has escaped that's supposed to be in imprisoned so they have died yet he calls them fugitives so they've escaped him into a realm where he cannot follow and bring them back so he really is here relaxing in the memories of old he's lonely today and he dwells within his mind on memories I think we all will do this in a way, if we had good childhoods, but you have to be able to dance with memories. That's why dementia is so cruel, because it robs you of that ability to look at the past and appreciate it. You're just in the present moment, confused. Verily, you have died too soon for me, you fugitive, yet you did not flee from me, nor did I flee from you. 
we are equally innocent in our disloyalty. So here, already, you begin to see his angst. You died too soon before he got to make more memories to really enjoy the time. But they were going to stay loyal to each other. The memories, the friends. But they both went. So death broke that promise. When you're loyal, you keep your promises. But the promise was broken, not by their own accord, but by time itself. So you can't really get mad at that. All you can do is reminisce. The lonely seafarer he mentioned earlier. So you see here again, Silent Isle, Lonely Seafarer, Wreath of Life, Evergreen Wreath of the Evergreen Trees. They endure the winter pretty well. They don't uh, get affected by the changing of the seasons as much. So that's why they're used a lot in s symbolic and allegorical references because they're so tough in the rain, snow, and heat. It's, they don't wither as easy. They keep their shape. To kill me, they strangled you, songbirds of my hopes. Ah, that's a clever one, right? So in order to hurt him indirectly, they had to take out the thing that pleased him. Indeed, after you, my dearest friends, malice has ever shot its arrows to hit my heart. When you have friends who can be with you and take off some of that mental burden, you are stronger. But when you're alone and you don't have someone to unburden yourself on, that can tear you apart real well. And comparing his friends to songbirds is unique because... Beautiful songbirds, they add joy to the air. You can't really get mad at them unless you're like an alcoholic who's hungover and doesn't want noise. But most of the time, if you've gotten enough sleep and you appreciate nature, you like the songbird. I know I do. And you start to identify them by their, by their sounds. Uh, a crow isn't a songbird, <laughs> you know, but I still like hearing them. There's tons of very vocal birds that have a very unique call. And like, even the woodpecker, they don't make a sound, but the way they go, drrr, drrr, and then you hear them in the woods, it like echoes and travels. It's relaxing, it texturizes the air. So, a city has no songbirds. It's, it's like, bah, 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 get out of the way, watch where you're going. Hey man, you got a quarter? You got a cigarette? It's so unpleasant. It's nasty. In the forest, you go there and sometimes there's a stillness, but in the morning, when the early birds are trying to get their worms, you feel the, the upbeatness, right? I think it's a huge compliment to compare your friends to the type of songbirds. He's using all the bird analogies here. Tombs of my youth, but then it mentions shy birds, but they're also trusting. And remember, he said, nor did I flee from you. So birds will flee, right? Like, they go away from you. But he mentioned a different type of behavior where they come and they trust. It takes time to build trust with a bird. And a bird has to be happy in order to sing their songs. And this looks like a mutually beneficial relationship is what we're getting at. When you look at all the examples he's putting in here for us in a poetic sense. And it hit. For you have always been closest to my heart. My possession and what possessed me. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. This sort of entwined nature. That is why you had to die young and all too early. The arrow was shot at my most vulnerable possession, at you, whose skin is like down and even more like a smile that dies of a glance. So, 
the arrow was shot on my most vulnerable possession. So this is, is fascinating because you'll see this in fiction a lot. Some people, some people will think if I take, if you hurt your enemy, that'll take them down. Some people can endure quite a lot when you get their loved ones. Think about when Cersei Lannister beheaded Missandei, uh, Daenerys Targaryen's uh, literally best friend, right? That was said to be one of the things that set her over the edge. Taking down her dragons. One of her dragons was taken down by the Night King. And one taken by Euron Greyjoy. So you can hit at someone's heart in a different manner than actually physically going to them. Right? You, you pick off the ones around them. But this word, I want to speak to my enemies. What is all murder of human beings compared to that which you have done to me? What you have done to me is more evil than any murder of human beings. You have taken from me the irretrievable, and thus I speak to you, my enemies, for you murdered the visions of and dearest wonders of my youth. Now, when you rob someone of their childhood and rob someone of their mind, yeah, that's a heavy hitter. My playmates you took from me, the blessed spirits, in their memory I lay down this wreath and this curse. This curse against you, my enemies, for you have cut short my eternal bliss as a tone that breaks off in a cold night. Scarcely as the gleam of divine eyes it came to me, passing swiftly as a glance. Thus spoke my purity once in a fair hour. All beings shall be divine to me. Then you assaulted me with filthy ghosts. Alas, where has this fair hour fled now? So, the unveiling, is what this is, what I'm seeing here. If you see everything as pure innocent beings and then you, you get a wake-up call to the raw reality of Earth, Disneyland is taken from you and now you're showed the phantoms. You're showed the filthy ghosts. You're showed evil. You get a glimpse. Now your innocence is gone. A wake up call. All days shall be holy to me. Thus said the wisdom of my youth once. Verily it was the saying of a wisdom. But then you, my enemies, stole my nights from me. And sold them into sleepless agony. Alas, where has the wisdom fled now? Okay, so. Here. Having this optimism, and then it goes going away, and then your nights are spent in worry and not harmony. Someone robbing you of sleep, of peace of mind. Once I craved happy omens from the birds, then you led a monster of an owl across my way. A revolting one. Well, I mean, <laughs> okay, so as Muslims we don't take omens in birds, right? But there are some people in mythology who don't like the way some birds behave. They snatch other birds. You know, owls are silent, so they spring on you. So you could just be chilling in the camp in woods, and you're like, that's a pretty bird. And all of a sudden, whoop, here comes that owl, and you're like, that's wild. And you think to yourself, how is that fair? But that owl has those eyes, and it's like, woohoo, woohoo. Come up from above. It's different, right? Falcons make a little squawk sometimes. Squish, 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 squish. The owl is more like, I have the silent wings of death, right? And some people get scared of owls and crows because of their sounds and what they do at night. You know, they 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 are very interesting birdie birds, but I don't. I think it's so wise that Islam, like, we don't take omens from birds, you know. It's ridiculous. All nausea I once vowed to renounce. Then you changed those near and nearest to me into putrid boils. Alas, where did my noblest vow flee then? I once walked as a blind man. A long blessed path. Then you threw filth in the path of the blind man. And now his old footpath. 
nauseates him. So, aloofness, indifference, now you are aware to a degree where you feel disgust. And when I did what was hardest for me and celebrated the triumph of my overcomings, then you made those who loved me scream that I was hurting them most. Ooh. There are some people who can see your advantages and change as an affront to them. Verily, this was always your practice, you galled my best honey and the industry of my best bees. To my charity, you always dispatched the most impudent beggars. Now, notice what well, is interesting. He's just talking about charity and the tapestry of Sally we was doing. So, he's very giving, but yet the most rude, entitled beggars show up. They're not very humble and appreciative. You know, you don't get that same feeling. You scoop, you know, get like bowl soup. Oh, thank you, my lord. But if someone's like, this is it, total different energy, isn't it? Almost makes you not want to give because of the response you're getting from the beggar. Around my pity, you always push the incurably shameless. So here we see what? It's hard to feel pity for someone who is sh shameless. Right? It's like, if there's a single mom, and you're like, Oh, I feel bad for her. I want to give her a job. But she's like, I don't need no man. I don't need to do nothing. I'm going to get my beer. I'm going to get my weed. And you're like, okay, I don't feel bad for you anymore. I feel bad for the children for having a mom like you. You see? When someone is shameless, it's hard to feel pity for them. So he's talking to me here a lot about his naivete, his oh, rosy outlook on the human race is like slowly getting eroded. Thus you wounded my virtue in its faith. And whenever I s laid down for a sacrifice even what was holiest to me, your piety immediately placed its fatter gifts alongside. And then the fumes of your fat what was holiest to me suffocated. Okay, so here, interesting example. All, all I have is, you know, of m the best of my flock is this skinny ram. And then the next guy shows up. Ah, I have a really chonky Wagyu beef cow, right? There you go. And the smell of that burning fat of the Wagyu beef overwhelms the lean meat of your ram. So... And then you're overwhelmed by the scent of their gift when yours is like kind of minimized. It almost reminds me of Cain and Abel. The fruits versus the meat sacrifice or offering rather. It can show you like you, but in Islam, you're not supposed to discount a gift. If it's like a, someone can only give you broth made from hooves. All right, better than nothing. Half a date in charity, right? you should not feel insufficient because you're gonna get a tenfold reward for every good thing you do right and you can earn good deeds so don't feel that only the rich uh, are, are gonna make it you can compete in good deeds and there's lots of ways in which you can earn those good deeds so here we see what he's getting at but us as muslims we see what we're doing and how we need not feel envious of someone else's contributions because on Judgment Day, everything will be recorded and you don't know how the odds will measure up. And once I wanted to dance as I had never danced before, all over the heavens I wanted to dance. Then you persuaded my dearest singer and he struck up a gloomy horn. Oh wait. Then you persuaded my dearest singer and he struck up a horrible dismal tune. Alas, he tooted in my ears like a gloomy horn, murderous singer, tool of malice, most innocent yourself. I stood ready for the best dance when you murdered my ecstasy with your sound. <laughs> That's funny. Next time someone has like a horrible song, and you're just like, you've murdered my ecstasy with your sounds. <laughs> Only in the dance do I know how to tell the parable of the highest things. So the joy you feel in compels from the dance, being ruined by someone who like led you to the negativity. 
And now my highest parable remained unspoken in my limbs. My highest hope remained unspoken and unredeemed, and all the visions and consolations of my youth died. So, the night, the, coming to know, right? You're young, you have friends, this blissful existence, the, 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 the purity of childhood, and then the older you get, the more the veil is peeled back, and you see what is earth. How did I get over and overcome such wounds? How did my soul rise again out of such tombs? Well, you are human, and you must endure. You are ever-changing, ever-getting stronger. Indeed, in me there is something invulnerable and unbearable, something that explodes rock. Now that has a good line. That is my will. Silent and unchanged, it strides throughout the years. Now it did change, though. Unchanged, it strides. Actually. He just explained to us how he literally did change. Okay? Peeling back of the layers revealed more of the will to live, this will to succeed, this will to keep going, to not succumb to the wounds, to overcome the wounds, to not linger in the tombs. It would walk its way on my feet, my old will. See exactly old will, new will, but the will remains, but it did change because if it couldn't if it couldn't change, there couldn't be new and old. And its mind is hard of heart and invulnerable. Hard of heart. So we have to make sure our hearts don't get too hard in it though. Invulnerable am I the only in the heel? Invulnerable am I only in the heel, so the Achilles heel. You are still alive and your old self must patient one. You have still broken out of every tomb. What in my youth was unredeemed lives on in you. And as life and youth, you sit there, full of hope and yellow ruins of tombs. Indeed, for me, you are still the shatterer of all tombs. Hail to thee, my will. And only where there are tombs are there resurrections. Thus sang Zarathustra. <laughs> So, hail to his will, he says, and only where there are tombs there are resurrections, hinting at the Jesus parable, right? Okay, Easter. For the Christians, despite the uh, rabbits and eggs, we see this sort of coming again. What is that called that the Asians have? I forgot. That sucks, I forgot, but Asians have... It's not feng shui. Oh, it's something that they talk about. Oh, I forget. My bad. But you will be broken down and reborn. Broken down and reborn. It's this constant building upon oneself. Becoming ever stronger. Really hints at his overman, his ubermensch ideal that he's talking about here so he's first he opens up with lots of melancholy nostalgia of the tombs of his youth the visions and apparitions how he recalls them he talks about loneliness okay losing what he wanted the arrows came in ow, 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 ow. and yet he still endured, and he still has his will to go on, and now he's harder of heart, so his heart is not as exposed, it's not as vulnerable to his enemies, okay? So, he's been humbled and humiliated, yet not defeated, okay? It's a very interesting section here. <laughs> it's still kind of funny, though, because, like... The murderous singer, the tool of malice. Just pointing also here out how the wrong type of auditory signals can ruin your mood. So if you're listening to heavy metal all the time, hard to be very positive with constant pumping in the brain of negative garbage, right? You can't see the beauty of the sunset when you have a song that's like, if these people shoot them in the face, da, 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 and you're just like, 
okay <laughs> it doesn't match so you can feel happy but then the music is like we're gonna do something about that right there's also the flip side some people who are sad and then they're like i want to revel in my misery put on some chopin nocturnes and you're like are you okay and you're like no i need to read edgar Allan poe and i need to say evermore and i need seven young blanc it's like uh okay man that's not good <laughs> right it's wild very unique sections very well written that's what i like kind of about nietzsche is you're gonna get some juiciness and these parables these symbolisms it's very good for creativity and i like re i like reading raw just like very informative stuff that's kind of dry but the creative side of nietzsche in this text is a bit of a relief in a unique way that can connect to the mind pretty easily let me know what you think and where there are tombs there are resurrections right very interesting <laughs> <laughs> if you're in the car with somebody and they put on some like Taylor Swift some like you murdered my ecstasy with your sounds <laughs> like Nietzsche and Shakespeare they got some good insults man instead of just saying turn that trash off or can you please turn it off it's like you can be like you murdered my happiness with peace of mind <laughs> oh, it's funny all right, fam. Take care. I'm still fundraising for the book holder and the panel. I'll let you know when I reach the goal. The goal. Uh, but until then, I'll keep uh, letting you know that that's still there in case you're wondering. And if you'd like to join the blog, go ahead and do that at www.subscribestar.com slash Hope to see you there.